Welcome to the Real Returns Podcast. I am Andrew Riker, and I'm your host. And with me, I have my co-host, Dan Crouchy. Dan, are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. I'm excited for today's show. Yeah, I can't wait to chat with George. Awesome. Well, we got a great show in store for today. So as Dan mentioned, um, we have George Cook. And George is actually the co-founder and CEO of Honeycomb Credit. And they are a community capital platform where anybody can invest in independently owned small businesses. Um, and the awesome thing is that gives you the potential to earn attractive returns and feel good about uh, where, your, where your money is going. So I really think they have an incredible business and a great business model. And so I'm excited to have George with us today. So George, if you wouldn't mind, why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself uh, to, the, to the show and maybe talk a little bit about the history of Honeycomb. Why did you get started doing this? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Andrew and, and Dan. Um, so the, the George Cook, uh, co-founder and, and CEO of, of Honeycomb Credit. Uh, my, my background is actually in community banking. Uh, so my family's been running a small community bank uh, in rural Appalachia for about 130 years. I grew up in the family business, a little bit of a kind of a George Bailey situation, uh, you know, kind of it's, it's a wonderful life. Um, learned a lot about community banking and, and community capital and, and really what that means for Main Street communities. And uh, ultimately spent most of my career doing kind of big data um, consulting work for, for large lenders. And I saw through that experience that there was this massive consolidation in the banking industry, that the banks that I was consulting were out acquiring the small community banks. And this idea of community capital and community lending was, was really disappearing. And that was disproportionately hurting small businesses who historically have relied on local lenders who obviously are going to look at the books, but they can look past the books and they can understand if the bakery makes a good baguette and understand if a small business is a good fit for the community that they're serving. Uh, and we've really gotten away from that in the United States. And so that, that was something that was weighing on me really heavily. Uh, I, I went back to grad school. I was thinking a lot about this from a big macroeconomic perspective. And I had the good fortune of meeting my co-founder who in grad school with me was also running a small business. A really smart guy, former investment banker, Ivy League MBA, couldn't get a bank loan. And I, I kept thinking to myself, you know, if Ken can't navigate this process, how is the average Main Street small business navigating this process? And so we put our heads together and, and we came up with the idea for Honeycomb to, to really allow local people in the community who love small businesses to serve as the community banker for the 21st century, to uh, obviously have the information they need to do financial due diligence, but also know the quality of a business and understand uh, you know, if that local restaurant, that local food manufacturer, the local brewery, whatever it might be, is, is making a product that's serving the community well and, and vote with their wallets to support those businesses and, and earn a return while they're at it. I love that, George. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting and unique about your model is the way in which it provides access. Um, as you were talking about, you know, a, uh, a group, you know, small businesses, for example, that are looking to get access to that kind of capital, um, but often find it challenging. And I get that personally. I've, uh, you know, struggled when it comes to financial acumen for loans and things like that at stages in my life. And so, you know, it's one of the things we're passionate about as well. We, um, we really believe in access to investment products when, um, when we think about our primary business as well. So I'm curious how, um, how you think about access in terms of particular stakeholders. Is there, uh, you know, a particular band of, um, of small businesses, whether you measure it by revenue or by uh, you know, employees, H how are you thinking of this is really the area that we saw as an underserved population that we wanted to provide access to? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And we really think about access, Honey comes a two-sided marketplace, right? We're serving businesses, but we're also serving people who want to invest in small businesses. And so we think about access on, on both sides. From the business perspective, what we've seen is since the Great Recession, 
the amount of loans flowing from traditional lenders to small businesses has just been dropping precipitously. It's down almost 50% um, through, through kind of traditional SBA loan products. Um, that's especially true for businesses that are located in disadvantaged communities. Um, right now, I think the statistics from, from the Small Business Administration is that of all the SBA loans in the United States, only about 3% of those are going to Black-owned businesses, despite the fact that Black-owned businesses are something like 15% of all businesses in the country. So it's just completely misaligned and, and really disproportionately hurting communities of color and, and chronically underinvested communities. And so when we think about the business owners that we're serving, we're thinking about, obviously we think that there's inherently good in, in small businesses of all, 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 all types. Um, they create local jobs, they pay local taxes, they make communities vibrant and, and more livable and fun. Um, but we especially think about how communities from, uh, businesses in communities of color, businesses in communities that have been chronically disinvested um, are, are really more acutely feeling the struggle to access capital. And so one of the things we measure internally is just the number of businesses based in low to moderate income communities, the number of, of minority owned businesses, the number of women owned businesses. Uh, we found that we, we were just kind of running the numbers a couple of weeks ago. And so far in 2022, 80% of the businesses we've worked with have been woman owned, minority owned, and or based in a low to moderate income community. That, that is unheard of in the lending industry, in the small business lending industry. Uh, and so that's, yeah, that's yeah, so that's something we're really, really proud of. Um, and, and our ability to put dollars to work in places where a lot of traditional lenders have unfortunately retreated in, in recent decades. On the other side of the house, on the investor side, uh, we, we aim to make investing really accessible. Um, we were a registered funding portal, which means that non-accredited investors can invest in our platform. So anyone um, with a U.S. tax ID number can invest on the Honeycomb platform. And that was really important to us because today, pre-Honeycomb, I should say, the only way to have ownership in a community was to buy property. But we all know with the, the affordability crisis, like uh, purchasing property is becoming more and more challenging. And so really to, to be able to put money to work in your own economy and, and have an ownership claim in your community and, and be a part of growth within your community has become also increasingly, increasingly inaccessible. And so having a $100 minimum investment and, and making it really approachable, um, we're finding that a lot of people that are investing in these small businesses are first time investors. It's the first time they've ever put money to work in, in any sort of investment asset. Um, and so they're growing their wealth side by side with their favorite business down the street from them. Yeah, I love the business model and you can just hear the impact that it's having. And um, you know, th those are things that I think um, are just so needed when it comes to um, creating those connections in in the economy. Um, so question for you, uh, you mentioned accessibility and anybody can invest in your platform. What is the minimum investment? Does it vary based on the business they're investing in? And um, you know, how, how does somebody get in if they're interested? Yeah, so, so the minimum investment is $100 um, across all of our campaigns. Uh, the, so, so we have a sort of a, a, a shopping list of all of the available small business campaigns on our website, honeycombcredit.com. So anyone can come and visit Honeycomb Credit, check out the, all of the small business offerings that are available. And then each of these businesses has a campaign page. That campaign page is going to include a video, some details about the owner, what they're going to use with the money. And then there's also a document, basically a lightweight investment prospectus. It's called a Form C that also comes along with each of these deals. So if someone wants to roll up their sleeves and do a little bit more diligence, understand the risk factors, understand the financials of the business, they can get under the hood a little bit and, and really assess which of the businesses are a good fit for perhaps their portfolio. And in terms of doing diligence, um, what is your 
diligence that you guys do on your end as well. Do, do you accept every company that applies? Um, is there, are there any like underwriting or diligence that, that you're doing as a platform? Yeah, we're, we're doing quite a bit of diligence. Um, we view it as our responsibility to make sure that business owners have a good head on their shoulder, that they have a good business plan, uh, and that they have a path to repay the debt that they're about to take on. Um, so we are looking at past financials uh, of the business. We are looking at uh, the, the personal credit of the business owner. We're looking at the business plan they're putting forward. Uh, most of the loans that we offer do have collateral coverage. So we're doing some analysis of, of the collateral coverage. And we're taking all of that together and putting it kind of in, into a package that people can, can really dig in and, and understand. Hey, hey, George, my understanding is that the track record has been pretty good thus far, but can you talk a little bit about the history and you know, reliability of these small business owners and making their payments? What's been your experience since starting the business? Yeah, we, we've, been, we've been incredibly humbled with, with how well the portfolio has performed, uh, you know, especially through the pandemic. Um, there was a lot of pressure on, on Main Street small businesses um, and, and just a wild roller coaster of, of the past couple of years. And you know, of of the loans that we have, um, the, the the businesses we've worked with, there's lower than a three percent charge off rate in our portfolio right now. Uh, a lot of other online lenders are are in the double digits. Um, so you know, I think this really speaks to the the diligence that we're doing as an organization, but also this idea that when you get local people who know small businesses voting with their own hard-earned dollars on these businesses, it's actually a really powerful signaling mechanism that a business is, is positioned to do well. Yeah. What are you typically funding in terms of, you know, these, these dollars go to the small business? Are they typically coming to you with a specific need of, hey, we need to purchase this equipment so we can expand our operations or... Is it more working capital or what do you see in terms of the actual practical impact of the dollars that you're lending to these small businesses? What are they doing with the funds? Yeah, it's, it's generally a tangible expansion project. Um, a lot of businesses that are moving into their first food truck and they need to buy the food truck and, and build out the food truck. A lot of businesses moving from their food truck into their first brick and mortar and they need the, 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 the new kitchen equipment. Uh, they need furniture and fixtures. Um, we work with, um, we've also worked with a number of businesses. I, I, sadly, as, as banks have retreated from, from the industry, there's, there's been some predatory players that have entered the small business lending space. Uh, they don't always very clearly share what their loan terms are. And, and we found some businesses kind of fall prey to to these predatory online loans and we've actually worked with a number of businesses to help them refinance um, those online loans or you know people that bootstrapped it and threw everything on a credit card and, and they woke up and all of a sudden they have a real business but they have forty thousand dollars of, of personal credit card debt because they threw everything on and and kind of built the business in, in, in uh, a really lean way we've also worked with businesses to kind of consolidate that debt get it on a term that makes sense for them uh, and really help them kind of formalize the business and take it to the next level. Yeah, that, that all makes sense. Um, you mentioned sometimes folks are moving into their kind of first bricks and mortar, and you probably know Dan and I are in the real estate business. So I'm curious, do any of your small businesses end up using some of the capital uh, in terms of buying a building that they might operate out of? Uh, and I, I guess a related question is I could see um, I could see small business investing being perceived as risky and actually owning physical assets being a way to de-risk those businesses, but that could be a bad assumption. So I'm curious, is that a part of your business model at all, or are you seeing that in any of your, your businesses? Yeah, we, we do see um, a fair amount of folks moving into a new space or a larger space. Um, most are thinking about it from, from a lease arrangement. They're, they're thinking about borrow or renting the space. We have a couple that we've talked to and we've worked with um, that are purchasing a building. 
And what we found is, j just because our, our terms are typically three to five years, so our, our product is not typically a very good mortgage product. Um, so we're typically not doing real estate mortgages for, for small businesses. But what we've often found is if a business is, is I, I, whether they're leasing or buying, moving into a new space, um, the bank, is, if they're getting a bank loan, it likely won't cover some of the kind of build out expenses. They, they might help purchase the property, but they won't necessarily help them with furnitures and fixtures and, and the things they need to make the space functional, but also to make the space their own and to really create a unique, um, a unique environment within that space. Uh, and so Honeycomb has frequently come, come in on top of a bank loan and work side by side um, with a traditional lender to help people get moved into a physical space. Um, to your point about the risk, yeah, it's, it's one of the things that we as an organization had to, to figure out in the early days is uh, how do you get collateral coverage for hundreds of people that might be lending to one small business? And so we had to work with our regulators and kind of build a structure um, to actually allow the crowd to have liens on whether it's physical assets or, or just kind of a blanket lien on the inventory of the business, whatever it might be. Um, but trying to, to make sure there's a little added protection for investors who, who are participating uh, in, in these you know, relatively risky small business loans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And again, it's, it's great to hear that um, your default rate has been so low. Uh, you know, I think it's really admirable. And 3% is, you know, like you said, kind of unheard of. Um, at the same time, I'm, you know, I'm sure that investors kind of ask those questions. What, you know, what happens if things, things go poorly here? So it's, it's good to know that you've thought through that. And I do think, um, so when it comes to the small business p and I, I often think about what are the really big categories of expense that they're paying. And, you know, obviously we see real estate in terms of the lease they may be paying or the mortgage as a big number. Um, what are some other big expenses? Is it payroll? Uh, you know, what, what are you seeing as the big expenses on on their P and Ls? Yeah, you know, especially right now, um, payroll is is huge, um, and and obviously just a lot of struggles of, of, of finding and retaining talent in, in the small business ecosystem right now, um, and and the the inflation's real. Uh, the the you know we, we do about two thirds of the businesses we work with are in some way, shape, or form in the food and beverage space. Uh, that ranges from you know, food manufacturing, the, the gourmet pickle company, to uh, microbreweries, micro distilleries, the whole way through to restaurants, food trucks, et cetera. Um, so so kind of all dimensions of food and beverage. Uh, but we have you know about two thirds of our businesses are, are food and beverage and, and rising costs are, are, are something that they're dealing with just in terms of raw materials um, and you know, cost of goods sold. Um, that they're ultimately you know, turning into into your meal. I was going to uh, backtrack a minute here and come back to this uh, eighty percent number that you threw out of uh, your uh, lending customers that are was it uh, women owned, minority owned, or based in uh, low income areas? To me, that's astounding, and that's an incredible accomplishment. I'd love to hear more about how you've achieved that and how you plan to continue it sounds like that's a part of your dna and what you really have set out to achieve and how how you plan to continue doing that as you scale i imagine it's got to be a tough thing to do but I, I applaud that and i'd love to hear more about how you guys have done it and how you plan to keep it up yeah you know it, it's something we we think a lot about and, and first and foremost um you know i think for us tracking the data is is the starting point, right? And, and I think that was a, a big, as a young startup, a big epiphany moment. If, if you can't you can't manage a business towards a result that you're not measuring, um, and so creating a systemic way to, to really understand the demographics of who our borrowers are um, was something we implemented a couple of years ago, and that has allowed us to really kind of understand. Um, how we're getting in front of really diverse groups of businesses and, and making sure that we're getting capital flowing in their direction. So um, that, that was a big lesson for, for us uh, you know, as an early stage startup. Um, I think since then, one of the big initiatives that we've launched is 
we, we rolled out a product a, a couple months ago where foundations and impact investors can actually participate on our platform and lend side by side with local retail investors to help level the playing field, to, to kind of be the proverbial rich uncle for someone who might not have a rich uncle in, in their network. And so we have, at this point, four foundations signed up and we're in conversations with, with about a dozen more to actually come onto the Honeycomb platform and provide these matching investments uh, once a business has kind of proven that they have community support um, to, to bring more money to bear to help these businesses get fully capitalized and set them up for success. And so actually building a product around this that is, that is really kind of targeted to businesses um, that, that uh, you know, might not have access to traditional capital is helping us prioritize this as an organization. It's, it's turned into a really big growth area for us. <laughs> yeah, that's I really cool. It's, it's amazing, George. Um, and, and I just appreciate that that's something that you care enough about the track that you mentioned you were kind of running the numbers and um, figured out exactly what that percentage was. I'm curious how you think about impact in terms of measurables. And um, this is obviously one clear way that you're thinking about it. Are there other metrics that you're that you're tracking that you're thinking about in terms of the impact that your organization is having? Yeah, totally. So I think I think for us beyond the you know who we're deploying capital to, I think one really clear way to think about impact is what what is that capital helping businesses achieve? And one of the things we've been measuring is the performance of businesses on a couple of different dimensions one year after they run a honeycomb campaign and a few of the data points we've been able to tease out so so one is that one year after running a honeycomb campaign our average alumni business is seeing a 40 percent increase in the number of yelp and google reviews that they have with an average 4.5 star rating at the same time, the average business is seeing an 80% increase in the number of, of Google News articles that mention them. So running a Honeycomb campaign is a great way to, to tie, you know, tie into a city paper or next Pittsburgh and say, hey, growing business, raising money, right? So these businesses are tend, to get, tend to get a lot of press while they're running a Honeycomb campaign. And all of a sudden, this, this campaign to raise capital has helped a business dramatically improve their digital footprint. They have 40% more reviews and 80% more mentions on, on, on Google News articles. That means that they are now easier to find online. And, and for any small business, being easy to find online drives foot traffic to the business. And, and that's been really, really powerful. The other thing that we've been tracking is just the overall change in revenue of a business after they run a campaign. Now, these are Main Street small businesses. They're typically growing maybe 10, 15% a year on average before running a Honeycomb campaign. One year after running a Honeycomb campaign, we have seen the revenue jump 60%, which can be a really life-changing amount of money for, for some of these Main Street entrepreneurs. Um, and so that's been really humbling. And so that, that's one of the ways we're thinking about impact. Obviously, where we're deploying the capital but how are businesses able to take advantage of that capital and how are they able to continue to grow their businesses once they actually have money in the bank? It's astonishing. Um, 60% boost is uh, unheard of, um, you know, really with the, those size businesses in particular. What do you attribute that to? Is it the return on the capital that is being influxed into the business? Is it some of the press and the PR that come alongside running a honeycomb? campaign what, what do you attribute the the boost to just generally yeah it's, it's, it's a good question and, and something we've been trying to tease out a little bit uh, obviously these are growing businesses and and they've just received capital to buy a new piece of equipment move into a larger location that's going to help them boost revenue right if it's a good business plan and it's a good use of funds then that will inherently help them grow uh, but beyond that i do think there is a 
sort of a PR marketing component of this and in two ways one the the, the press and the articles that you alluded to but also this idea that once someone is invested in my business they're probably going to be more engaged with my business even if someone invests a hundred dollars in my coffee shop if they're debating between going to my George's coffee shop or Starbucks then maybe they're going to think it, it, it twice and go, go to a couple blocks further to George's coffee shop because they want to see how their investment's doing, right? And so we're seeing a little bit of behavior change from people that invest in these businesses. And that's a, a pretty significant contributor to what, what's driving some of those revenue increases. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, what is your hope for these small businesses in terms of Sort of graduation from honeycomb do you, do you actually want to see them again in a few years when they have a another capital need or do you hope that they become more bankable by traditional you know lenders or you know, what's what's graduation look like and what's your hope for them yeah so what, one of the things that we found when we started honeycomb our, our average loan size was about twenty five thousand dollars today it's almost seventy five thousand dollars so we've been pretty steadily increasing the average size of the loan, not because we don't do $25,000 loans anymore, but because we've built a bigger pool of investors on our network, um, because we've improved the technology and improved conversion rates and made it easier for people to invest. And for those reasons, we've started to gain confidence that we can continue to serve businesses for a longer period of time. And so we, we're seeing a lot of businesses come back. They, they need that initial piece of capital to do a relatively small project. Things go well, two years later, they're coming back and doing a, a larger project with Honeycomb. And we can keep working with them for a longer period of their life cycle um, as our product gets better, as, as our investor network gets better. That said, we are seeing businesses move on a path to bankability. And for us, that's a win. Um, by definition, we have no prepayment penalty on our platform. Uh, that's just, just a rule that I've put in place. I don't believe in prepayment penalties. Uh, and we've seen a, a couple of businesses uh, who were not bankable when they ran their Honeycomb campaign uh, make successful payments for a couple of years, and then they're able to get a bank loan or a credit union loan and able to refinance their, their Honeycomb loan. Investors win, the businesses win, uh, we're, we're creating this path to bankability. And, and for us, that, that, that's a win. George, I can just tell you're passionate about improving people's lives and uh, ha having impact in the work that you do. I'm curious, how has your philosophy developed over time? Is, um, is this something you feel like you've always cared deeply about, or is it um, something that a particular piece of content or um, you know, particular education has developed over time? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I think for me, I, I am, I meet many born entrepreneurs th through my work, people that are just, uh, they, they need to be their own boss. They're incredibly driven. Um, I, I was in corporate America. I was, I was a pretty happy cog in the wheel. I, I enjoyed that work. Um, but I think in, in many ways, the stars just kind of aligned in an area that, that I was uniquely passionate about and, and uniquely um, qualified to, to have a, a pretty good perspective, I feel. Um, and you know this, this all kind of aligned while, again, I was in grad school. I had the good fortune of meeting my co-founder, who was kind of the other side of the same coin. Um, and, and I had a, a, a professor who several professors who really kind of helped shape this concept, but, but one in particular that, that really drove things home, who was studied a lot of reverse innovation. This idea that in developing economies where the infrastructure in the economy doesn't exist in the same way that it might in, in the United States or Europe, um, the, that as these countries develop, they skip some steps. Um, we, you, people always talk about, you know, mo most countries in Africa don't have physical landline phones because they don't need them. They jump straight to cell phones. Um, in a lot of developing economies, the same is true for the banking system. In the United States, we had a really robust community banking system that was built up literally over centuries. But in a lot of other developing economies, they didn't have that. And so they had some really innovative microfinance solutions 
that helped fill the gap because they didn't have local community lenders. And kind of through this class, I learned, started to learn uh, more about uh, Muhammad Yunus and, and the work he did to start Grameen Bank. He went on to win a Nobel Prize. Um, and so, you know, that to me was, was a really uh, interesting lesson um, that, that some of this micro lending, some of these micro lending concepts have actually been really well developed in, in other countries. And so uh, I was able to, to, as I was thinking about the, the, how broken small business lending was in the United States, was at the same time able to, to get this perspective and learn um, about how micro lending worked in other parts of the world and bring some of that reverse innovation um, back as, as we're trying to rethink small business lending in the United States. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I love the uh, reality that in a lot of these developing countries that they often leapfrog some of our technology and our advancements. I've heard a similar discussion around cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin. Um, and I'm curious, given that you're in sort of the investing space, if if you have a perspective on kind of monetary policy and how, um, you know, how, how currency is playing into that. And, and if you have a viewpoint on Bitcoin or crypto as an investment, too, I'd be curious to hear it. Yeah, you know, I think I think I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by by cryptocurrencies and i think um I, I, as an organization you know behind the scenes under the hood a lot of what honeycomb is doing is just moving money around a lot right we have hundreds of people that invest relatively small amounts of money into a small business we need to move the money from those people deploy it to the small business take the money from the small business and deploy it back to all those people so there's a lot of really small financial transactions and what I know is that the banking system is really poorly equipped to do that. It's very expensive to move small amounts of money around. Where I see you know, the, the, the future of cryptocurrency and really the blockchain behind cryptocurrency is it's a much more efficient way to move small amounts of money around, which creates some really interesting ways to democratize finance. Now, I, I think there's obviously been a lot of speculative uh, investments around crypto, and the, the technology just isn't there yet. A company can't, like Honeycomb has a really hard time reliably using blockchain technology to accomplish something like that. Um, so we need to see the technology be a little bit more advanced. I, I think we need to see some of this speculative, uh, some, some of the speculation fall off. Um, but the, the, there are some really interesting applications of the underpinning technology, and I'm really excited to see how those evolve over the next few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of wisdom there. Go ahead, Dan. I just have to ask, the, uh, you mentioned Muhammad Yunus, and uh, I love his work. I find it really inspirational as well. Is there any chance that doing something internationally or in the developing world would it's obviously not core for honeycomb and your your basic mission but is that on your radar or have you given a thought to at some point uh visiting the developing world with your business we've got some work to do uh you know there, there are there are eight million storefront small businesses in the united states uh that 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 we're focused on now um but the reality is the technology we've built the tools we have um can can work and a lot of different ecosystems. So we're, we've got we've got a really big market to capture with, with a lot of education um, to capture that market. So we're we're really very focused heads down for the next few years on on building out the U.S. market. Um, but yeah, there, there's some really interesting applications for for this technology in other markets as well. All right, George, I feel like I have a good sense for your business and the impact that you're having. Um, I think there's a ton of value there to both your investors and your small businesses and bringing them together in a unique way. Um, let's get a let's get a sense for who George Cook is. So uh, we're gonna jump into the lightning round. Uh, first question is, what's your biggest win? Biggest win. Um, so from from a professional perspective, I think. I, I just hit the five-year mark at, at Honeycomb. And so uh, to me, that was a huge milestone. The fact that uh, kind of jumping into something, into the deep end, starting something from scratch, 
uh, and still still being here five years later feel, feels really good. Yeah, that's good. And I'm sure you know the statistics on small business failure in the first five years tends to be higher. So um, you feel like you've gotten past a milestone that it's, uh, you know, it, it's kind of uh, downhill from here. Is that how you're feeling? We've got, we've got a lot of work to do, but, but we've definitely built a foundation to, to keep growing the business for sure. Yeah, great. All right, George, favorite movie? So fa- this is a tough one. I, I, I think uh, one I've been coming back to a lot lately is The Darkest Hour. Uh, I'm a huge Winston Churchill fan. He's one of my favorite historical figures. Um, I think it's a great interpretation of, of kind of the early days of, of his prime ministership. Uh, and so um, d- Darkest Hour. Darkest Hour. Actually haven't seen that. I'll have to check it out. Favorite food? Anything fermented. So I've been on a big like kimchi sauerkraut <laughs> fix lately, um, but kombucha pickles. If it's if it's fermented, I love it. <laughs> All right, that is a uh, you know definitely an acquired taste for many. So that's good. To We're know. not going to be eating together anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, those are all the things Dan hates: <laughs> olives and beets. Ugh. Um, uh, awesome. How about uh, current growth edge? What, what's something you're working on uh, improving personally or professionally? C- current growth edge for us is is our team. Um, we really kind of beginning in this year just like sat down and, and kind of built rebuilt how we think about reaching small businesses. Um, they're they're a tough customer. Uh, they they're it's in the name. Business owners are busy people. Uh, and so mm-hmm. how to, to kind of get in front of businesses and deliver them a message that's going to resonate through channels that, that makes sense for them. Uh, and, and so for us, um, you know, it, 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 I, I think that, that surrounding myself with really good people who can help me solve that problem has been, has been our edge. Yeah, I feel like that's the edge of probably every small business. <laughs> so uh, that makes sense. How about any A plus content that you're taking in these days? What what are you really enjoying listening to or reading, uh, in kind of in your in your free time? So I, I have, I think like many people, just been so fatigued by the 24 hour news cycle over the past couple of years, and I recently got back into The Economist which is just, you know, weekly news publication, and I am loving it. They have a great audio version of it, and so it's, it's uh, instead of, like, constantly checking the news and seeing what the Fed is doing and seeing what's happening in Congress, I just kind of take a step back and, and over the weekend with a, a cup of tea, kind of leisurely enjoy the, the news over the past week and, and kind of break it all down. And, and helping me kind of break out of that 24 hour news cycle. And, and it's been really refreshing. Yeah. That sounds like a far less stressful way to consume news content. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, well, George, that's going to be it for the show today. Um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I really enjoyed learning a little bit about your business, learning a little bit about the impact that small businesses can have on their local communities and that we can have as investors uh, by in investing directly in those small businesses. So for our listeners out there, you know, hopefully you, uh, you, know, you got a chance to hear a little about, bit about an opportunity where you can invest directly in your local businesses and have, have impact directly through them. Uh, thanks to our listeners for listening, and thanks again, George Cook, for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me.